Fran is NZME's Head of Business and the Executive Editor of Mood of the Boardroom. And as Murray said earlier, 21 years of Mood of the Boardroom, it's an incredible achievement and those reports provide a great record of politics and business uh, attitudes of the day over the last two decades. So congratulations Fran, over to you to take us through the numbers. Now, thank you very much, Tim. I sat down last night and I calculated um, what 21 years of mood of the boardroom actually works out to. And it's more than two and a half years of my working life. So, um, you know, some stage I've got to write the book because Tim is quite right. Looking back through 21 editions, it is actually a microcosm of New Zealand politics and business. And, you know, you can chart it that way. And so my sabbatical next year will probably be spent doing that. Thank you. Anyway, here we are. Uh, 2023, the election is upon us in a couple of weeks' time, and the mood is certainly sharpening. And uh, I'd like to just start a little bit, though, by talking about some of the issues that kind of preface uh, how we're thinking about things this year. But first of all, um, here we are, 120 respondents this year. Now, the survey was done in two parts. We started at the end of August, went through to September 20. That was the bulk of the survey. And then on Monday night, we went out to the market again, to the field, to ask those who'd responded what they thought about some key issues, particularly the tax cuts package, but not only that, some issues that had kind of risen through the campaign that we didn't capture in the first uh, part of that. So looking for balance across that, uh, because we did actually look into grants policies, but we didn't know what Nicola was doing at that time. So it was important to, to play fair. Okay, so... Looking at these top issues and what CEOs are saying, I think it's quite true that there is concerns about social cohesion, and we've seen through the election campaign a range of issues that have surfaced, be it from co-governance to allegations of racism to whatever. And these will play out in the coalition uh, makeups later on. But I like this comment from Catherine McGrath from uh, Westpac about the range of challenges that we're having to step up to and tackle faster than we thought. And she talks here about the impacts of climate change, infrastructure, but this question here, which I think we all need to consider, is how do we get New Zealand to walk together at the same pace rather than pull apart? And there is that uh, lack of cohesion in the country at this stage. Uh, another comment here from Andrea Schoon, who can't be here today, but like Chris Quinn at Foodstuffs, has to deal with retail crime. And this is actually a major that's happening in their industries, and it's quite confronting. Uh, she talks about violent and aggressive behaviour, having to work with the teams and greater safety training. And we're seeing that right across, be it from tall buildings like where I live, right across town, there are these issues out there. But also she talks about beyond obvious societal drivers are issues like how social media and TikTok are exacerbating copycat uh, behaviours. So this is something business hasn't had to confront for some time. And what we've seen in the survey, for instance, is um, really uh, something novel this year, and that's crime and law and order has surfaced to be the number four issue for you when you think about domestic concerns. Uh, things like schools, shortages, used to be up the top, not anymore. There are other issues which have come to the fore. And then uh, a comment from Craig Stobo about anger being in the air and anger at the cost of living, still some hangover from the COVID and the job mandates. And we saw that yesterday, I guess, with the March on Parliament, which was actually quite peaceable for a change. But anyway, his comment is, we're left with this gross public debt profile, rising interest costs and a diminishing buffer for natural disasters. And I think that's what the finance ministers have found over the last couple of decades, be it with uh, the National Party government when they had to deal with uh, Christchurch and the Canterbury earthquakes, and also with um, Grant Robertson, who's had to go to the market for debt to sustain us through COVID. So disasters happen, and you know the next government is gonna to have to pay down debt because sure as heck, it's gonna raise again when the next disaster happens. And we just need to look back through the last 20 years. And, but what he has suggested there is a rethink of delivery, including asking business uh, to help. And this is something we've seen come through the survey, and it has over several years. Business wants to be at the table a bit more, but that also requires business to accept responsibility. 
So here we are. This has uh, been the main event. It's got more interesting over the last couple of weeks. At the first campaign bash between these two, it was pretty much a boring affair. Uh, that's what you all said in the uh, survey, because we asked you about on Monday what you felt about the campaign. Uh, you did feel at that stage Christopher Luxon had the edge. But in actual fact, on this week, uh, you saw Chris Hipkins come out of the corner. Uh, he was punchy. He, he socked it back to Christopher Luxon. So it's interesting. It might be an element of atmospherics, but this audience, I think, is also looking for policy rigour. So looking at uh, the issues around optimism this year, this is a perennial question that we look at each year. Uh, optimism on the global economy, uh, that has actually come up a bit this year. And maybe we're getting used to living in times which are difficult and you know, which require a certain amount of agility. Uh, we don't have quite the same concerns about supply chains, those sorts of things, which were right up there during COVID. But geopolitical volatility, cyber attacks, that's come right up as an issue, major weather events, climate change, insurance, rising cost of insurance worldwide, and Blair Turnbull has some interesting comments in the survey on that. Protectionism, rising nationalism, natural disasters, these are all parts of the risk assessments that you're making in your boardrooms. Uh, looking to the, I've just gone through those top international risks, but actually looking to um, confidence in your own industry, down slightly, but I think that's really just at the margin. So talking about business expectations on the rise for a number of you, profits, revenue, staff hiring, but there is a downward pressure as well coming in across those metrics, as you can see up there. Uh, a number of you keeping hiring intentions at the same, and, but however, 30% looking to decrease. And that is coming at a time when the next government will also be thinking about who's on the public service payroll. So possibly it's going to get a bit tricky coming into... 2024. Uh, optimism in the New Zealand economy, uh, pretty, pretty flat, frankly, if you take out the error margin on that. But uh, what is interesting here is these uh, top domestic concerns and overriding uh, the usual business concerns are government spending, the quality of government spending, inflation, the need to get infrastructure moving properly, and also, again, crime, law and order. And you can see there some of those other issues like skills and labour down at uh, 10th place this year. So that's actually quite a shift uh, in what normally concerns business and certainly has over the last five years. Uh, we did go out to uh, and looked about whether the Reserve Bank single focus on inflation should sustain. 56% uh, yes, 29% no. So um, we don't see, uh, you know, sorry, that there should be a single focus on inflation. So there's a slight shift there, and that'll be a question for uh, succeeding governments. Uh, one of the things we did was we had a look at the rise of Chris Hipkins. And at the start of the year, we would not have predicted that Chris was going to be the new Prime Minister. In fact, uh, Grant, we probably thought it would have been you. And uh, because you had been in the mix several times, you'd been the understudy to, to um, Jacinda Ardern, and you had held the country together through quite a considerable period of time. However, we did look also as whether um, his replacement of Jacinda Ardern was a game changer, and again, 60% no, 27% yes. One of the interesting comments that came through from a number of you was, if Chris Hipkins had gone and called a snap election, he possibly could have won. Uh, but what's happened in the intervening uh, six months is a deterioration in the government's standing. And um, I see Grant raising his eyebrows on that one, so that might be a question for Murray further down the track. But um, it's... Um, what happened also was he did have an opportunity to demonstrate leadership with Cyclone Gabriel and the floods in Auckland. And I think we did see him demonstrate early on considerable command as Prime Minister, getting out and about and around the nation. But we did ask how he had fared as PM over that time. One of the things you said about him was he is a fine political performer. And you can see all those years in Parliament, the understudying and opposition, working uh, for various ministers back in the day, he has learnt the ropes, as indeed has uh, Nicola Willis as well, and also Grant Robertson. 
Each of these people are professional politicians. And this is very interesting, I think. But also, uh, he has got out and promoted New Zealand internationally. Uh, the China trip, not only that, he's been to the UK, he's met the King, he's um, signed off the EU FTA, he's been and seen Albanese twice in Australia, and also been part of, I guess, shepherding in those greater moves in Australia towards New Zealanders being able to enjoy uh, citizenship there. And that is very much off the back of a Labour-led initiative on this side of the Tasman too, and prosecuted in Australia by Dame Enoch King. Uh, he did the policy bonfire, and that was kind of medium-rated, uh, something business had been after for some time. But within that is an issue, and the issue is this. Once you start getting rid of policies, people then start to doubt what you are promising. So it's a two-edged sword. One, you're clearing the decks, but are you going to actually get through the next ones? And that is something which has been raised. Uh, he worked hard to build confidence with business. He came to Auckland a lot. And uh, comments here from those who have been in the room who appreciated uh, the visits he made to Auckland. And they have been pretty much weekly uh, for all that time. But where he fell down was on leading a cohesive cabinet. Four cabinet ministers gone, and this is something which has unfortunately led to a loss of confidence, I think, as far as he's concerned. A comment here from Mike Fugue from Contact Energy. Chris has done well, you couldn't fault his instincts and energy levels, but the levels of idiocy within his own caucus, outside of Woods and Robertson, are uh, beggar's belief. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Grant Robertson would not uh, say just two people are competent in that, uh, in that cabinet, but the, the, there is a perception out there that um, you know, things have uh, come to a bit of a pretty pass. And that is unfortunate. It's obviously something that Chris Hipkins would never have thought when he took on the job. Another comment here that we did, we went out and we asked you all what you felt about Jacinda Ardern's legacy. And this is really interesting. This elicited the most uh, comments from the entire survey. 100 of the 120 actually piled into this one and considerable thought. I like this one and it is actually quite reflective of what people are saying. Uh, the most authentic leader of the period, and Erica Crawford is talking about internationally, not just locally. Uh, New Zealand perceived as kind, compassionate under her leadership, and again, the mosque attacks and a range of aspects, and also during COVID, holding the country together during that period, as indeed did Grant from a fiscal uh, perspective. The other unfortunate thing over the last uh, period, the FPP period, and don't tell Winston Peters that, but um, staggering incompetence in her view and New Zealand lost its shine. And this is perhaps one of the kinder comments on that because people have been quite concerned. Uh, looking at the government KPIs, uh, trade agreements, getting stuff done, way up there. Honouring Māori and Pacifica aspiration, rated well. Management of COVID, again rated well. Policy execution, not so. And again, it comes back to that double-edged sword around policy bonfires, policy execution. So, what a surprise. We saw Damien, uh, uh, Damien O'Connor uh, rated right up the top this time, and that's possibly because he does have a reputation for nailing things. Uh, he was out of the box during COVID. Uh, you know, he actually caught COVID a couple of times, I think, as did his, um, his aides, uh, trade negotiators, and they were out in the world sealing up uh, deals on New Zealand's behalf while the world was still in international COVID pandemic. Uh, again, James Shaw rated as credible, liaises a lot with business on climate issues. Uh, the newcomer up there, Karen McAnulty, uh, come to the fore. I'm not quite sure why, but he's had a lot of profile during uh, the uh, uh, elements around, around the um, Hawke's Bay and so forth and dealing with emergency management and has had a quick elevation after other ministers dropped down. And then, of course, Grant and um, Chris Hipkins. We asked uh, whether, in totality of all of this, whether National was a credible government in waiting. And 57% said yes, but there's still a large number of people who are unsure about that. And possibly that is because 
the story about the economic policy has not been told. What, in fact, does actually National stand for? Things have got polarised on the tax cuts package and various other minutiae, but there's a bigger story there that also needs to be told. Uh, we looked at uh, the front bench, and you can see there uh, Nicola Willis to the fore, again, rated highly by you, uh, Erica Stanford, Chris Bishop, and also Shane Retty. But Christopher Luxon in fifth place, an honour he shares with Mr Hipkins on the other side. So the two Chrises are not rated to the fore, they're actually rated a bit further down the pack, which is interesting because we don't often see that in this survey. We also looked at the top issues facing the nation and what CEOs are saying on the fiscal outlook. In terms of um, Grant being a credible finance minister, that's dropped back a bit this year. It was very high rating during COVID, and people forget that. I mean, one of the slings that National uh, places against Labor is the major debt thing, and, uh, but actually forgetting how much of that was to sustain people in this room, as well as employees, through COVID. So the government took on a huge poultice of cash, as did, for instance, um, a range of economies around the world. We're not alone in that, and I'm sure Grant can point to the various um, national rating agencies, reports and otherwise, that uh, talk to that, but that's his gig. Anyway, uh, people have said uh, from investment banker, credible and admired up to COVID, questions after that. Uh, asking whether the next government should make major expenditure cuts, yes, uh, again, a clear majority on that. And in the report, you will see a lot of suggestions from business, not just purely the public service, which carries uh, a few issues as well, uh, but um, right across the board, thinking about what that should be. Uh, we asked whether uh, Grant would manage the debt track. Uh, a little bit of concern there. Is it too little, too late? And a really um, cutting comment here, I don't trust they will develop deliver anything, and uh, a comment here about still waiting for that one centimetre of the light rail to Mount Roskill that Jacinda promised, and no business case after six years. So again, these issues about picking what the policies and delivering on them are pretty important for business confidence. We asked about whether Nicola would be a credible future finance minister, and 83% of you agreed on that. And another said uh, Nicola appears over the detail and does inspire confidence. But however, where is the plan? And um, again, uh, asked whether National has a coordinated plan focused on ensuring New Zealand's sustainable economic future. Only 55% said yes, and 31% are unsure. And that story needs to change because, you know, accidents happen, crises happen, you need to have a plan. And again, scepticism over the uh, tax cuts package, which we uncovered when we went out to the market on Monday night for that 24-hour poll. From Don Braid, uh, failing to disclose the details behind the calculations increases the risk that this is just political rhetoric. And again, this issue fixed the fundamental issues around the economic malaise, rather than trying to be cute about tax breaks. Uh, from Cameron Baggery, again, uh, develop an economic plan and chart a fiscal course. He makes the point we need discipline, but we also have extensive social and infrastructure deficits to address. So this is going to be quite a difficult balancing act for whoever is running the economy after October. We also went out and asked about rating the next uh, Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins at 2.95 out of 5, uh, Christopher Luxon ahead at 3.24 out of 5. And here are a range of metrics that we uh, test on each election. And in this one, a political management, Chris Hipkins well outpoints Christopher Luxon, but on every other metric there, economic management, courage to make the right calls, and also vision and strategy for New Zealand, uh, Christopher Luxon comes ahead. I'm not sure about the ability to form a working coalition, given the changes over the last week or two, now that New Zealand First is in the game as well. But anyway, time will tell on that one a bit. <laughs> Um, we went out and we asked whether David Seymour had uh, positioned ACT as a credible partner for National. Again, support on that. And looking at the best coalition for business, again, support for National and ACT. 
However, best coalition for business, put Mr. Peters in the mix, and that goes right down. So to 5%. So anyway, this is, a, this is a very interesting period about how this particular three-legged stool might get up. OK, <laughs> moving on. Credible partner for Labour, uh, pretty much uh, solid around James Shaw. But if you talk about the other side of the equation of what's happening in the Greens, the part of it that is not blue-greens, but is actually red or socialistic, uh, people aren't so happy about that. Uh, we asked whether Te Pāti Māori was a credible partner for Labour. Again, uh, pretty much the jury is out on that, just 11% saying yes. So looking to the top issues facing the nation, one of the things that we asked about is um, how do people perceive the future? And one of the things there is wanting to increase productivity, and this is from Greg Forum, so New Zealanders can embrace and not fear automation and digital disruption, share the gains with employees and create a rewarding and engaging work, and lift education so we have a workforce capable of contributing to an increasingly productive economy. Uh, this is something that is actually within the palms of everyone in this room. It's not a government thing, and it is replicated by a number of people uh, in the survey. Uh, it's not a matter of beating up on the government. It's actually a matter of developing your own teams. And so when we are talking about business wanting to play a bigger role with the government, it also needs to play a bigger role on its own patch. And I think there is recognition in there. And I commend to both of you, um, Nicola and Grant, the comments that have come through from very genuine people in the report talking about the major issues uh, confronting New Zealand and what they think is the solutions to that. Uh, it's genuine, it's um, well thought out, and I think it's right on the money. So, to the main event. Talking about Grant Robertson, um, the message to you is you have bolstered business during the COVID pandemic, and there's subsequently been inflation, cost of living crisis, and cyclones. It's been a tough few years. You've actually held your nerve, and we do value your leadership, irrespective of some comments. And to Nicola, if you are finance minister after October 14, you also will likely face multiple crises as did Grant and as did Bill English before him and Michael Cullen. So it's important to have that sustainable economic plan. It's been a short apprenticeship, but you'll be judged on results, not politics. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, friends. Some very clear messages in there for our two guests uh, today. We're about to get the keynote addresses uh, started and then, of course, onto the finance debate. Just before uh, we do that, um, I'll just mention that we do welcome questions from the audience. Uh, if you do have a question you'd like to put to our speakers, uh, you can go to slido.com and enter the event code MOTB23. So that's MOTB, Mood of the Boardroom 23. It is now my pleasure to invite Murray Kirkness back onto the stage. Thank you very much, Murray. Over to you. Morning again. Uh, Grant and Nicola, of course, have been on the road for a few weeks and don't need a huge introduction. I think this is their fifth or sixth head-to-head -head debate in a matter of a couple of weeks. Uh, probably spending more time together than perhaps with your significant others. <laughs> from, what I've, from what I've observed, it's actually a similar relationship that some of us have with our significant others <laughs> from time to time, quite frankly. Uh, there has been some fiery debate during these events, and we're very happy for this morning to be the same. I would, though, just quickly quote Herald Letters to the editor correspondent Bernard Walker of Papamoa, published today, that a cacophony of verbiage in debates like this makes no sense in context. These people are supposedly adults and not like the verbal equivalent of a barroom brawl. Quite right, but let's have at it. Ladies and gentlemen, first up this morning, we have Minister of Finance, Grant Robertson. Please welcome him to the stage. Grant. Grant's a keen sports fan, also our Minister of Sport. He entered Parliament in 2008. He served as the Minister of Finance since 2017, was the 19th Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand. He is the MP for Wellington Central. Grant, you have two minutes. 
Kia ora. Is it two minutes? Two I minutes was, to start. I thought it was a little longer than that. Um, kia ora. Uh, nā mihinui ki koutou katoa. Thanks um, very much for this invitation to the Grafton Socialist Club. Uh, it's always a, a great pleasure uh, to be with you. Um, Murray, I'm a little bit concerned actually that uh, your comment earlier on about Nicola and I has been taken very seriously by the hotel here because they actually put us in adjacent rooms last <laughs> night. Uh, <laughs> suffice to say we both stayed in our rooms. Um, <laughs> Uh, look, from my perspective, Murray, um, it's always a good opportunity to come to the mood of the boardroom and, and feel the pulse of, of where uh, the big end of town is at. There's absolutely no doubt that New Zealand and the whole world have been through some extremely challenging times. But I think the New Zealand economy is resilient. And if I take up Phil Love's uh, uh, comment earlier on, that now is the time ever more for ambition. But I'll say this, Phil, ambition has some underpinning things. And one of those is inclusion, and another of those is opportunity. And over the course of the last few years, we've worked really hard to make sure that all New Zealanders got through, so that actually we kept people in work, and we have unemployment at record lows, that we kept businesses going. And now I do see light at the end of the tunnel for the New Zealand economy, with our growth rate in the June quarter being the second highest among all of our trading partners. So now is the time to push forward and be the very best little trading nation in the world. So that means more of the FTAs. Really proud of the seven FTAs that we either upgraded or signed in this term. But now let's invest further in our skills, in our infrastructure, in making sure that we lift the value of what we do, the best sustainable agricultural country in the world, the best sustainable tourism country in the world and investing in the new economy where we bring our scientists from public and private sector together, lift our R&D spend, lift our investment, and actually create those higher wage, low emissions job. Climate change is not just an existential threat to the planet, it's also where our economic future lies if we harness what we're good at and build on that. We have ambition as a country, we have been resilient, now is the time to make the most of that. Thank you, Grant. You're welcome to stay or take a seat. And now in the blue corner, to quote uh, Herald Business Editor-at-Large Liam Dan, Dan from earlier this week, Nicola Willis. Prior to becoming an MP, Nicola held a number of senior management roles at New Zealand Dairy Cooperative Fonterra, served on the boards of Export New Zealand and the New Zealand Initiative. Uh, she has been an advisor to John Key, both in opposition and as PM during his first term in government. She also has a postgraduate diploma in journalism. So if politics doesn't work, give me a call. <laughs> Nicola, you also have two minutes. Uh, well, look, thank you. It's uh, great to be in this room this morning. Can I acknowledge you, Fran, uh, for this ongoing survey? I was highly amused by the description one anonymous person had for me, in which I was both a school mum, but also Whitney Houston-like. And so I'm not quite sure this morning whether I should burst into lecture or song, but I think what we can confirm is I am indeed a woman. Um, <laughs> Look, we, we meet in what are very challenging times for our economy. Inflation, which Grant once described as a temporary challenge, has been remarkably sticky. Interest rates are high and have risen very quickly. Our economic trajectory is of uh, next to no growth on a per capita basis, according to the Treasury, uh, and recessionary conditions according to the Reserve Bank. And when we look ahead, we also have a set of government books that are in worse shape than they have been in many, many years, with debt high and large deficits. Whoever leads the next government has an important job to rebuild the economy, to foster the conditions and confidence needed for growth, uh, and to restore discipline to the government books, to put a lid on inflation and ensure uh, that New Zealanders have a lower cost of living and better incomes. National's plan for achieving that is actually in part about giving the people in this room the policy settings that will make you want to invest, create better paying jobs uh, and make this the productive economy it needs to be. Our job is to restore discipline to government spending, to deliver better results for the money that we do spend, and to chart a course back to debt reduction. It is to lower tax for working people, because while many sectors and many institutions have had inflation adjustments, 
working people have not had inflation adjustments to their tax brackets. It's to reduce red tape and regulation and ensure that we are making it easier to do things, build things, make things. It's about driving and delivering infrastructure, skills and innovation and Two connecting minutes. to the world. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to talking about our plans. Sorry. Okay, folks, uh, just to outline how we're going to operate this morning, thank you for the questions that are coming in. Uh, we're going to go through a series of questions. We've got till 8.40 or thereabouts, Fran, is that right? Yep, um, <laughs> always obey the boss. Um, we've got till about 8.40, so a minute each per answer. I've got some questions for both of you and some as individuals. We'll start with a question for both of you. Fran's advice uh, at the end of her um, presentation was that you'll be judged on success, not on politics. Mm. Nicola, why should we trust you and your team? Because we stand in the footsteps of national governments past that have risen to the kinds of challenges we see today. The job ahead of the next government is to restore discipline to the way the government spends its own money and to ensure that we can both fund increases to frontline services that New Zealanders rely on, but also ensure that we are paying down debt at a more rapid rate. It is time for a government that is ready to partner with the private sector to get huge infrastructure projects off the ground. New Zealand simply can't continue with the infrastructure deficit we have seen. It's time for a government that invites business in and listens, because actually, if New Zealand is going to get out of its current growth hole, we need to be working with you and you need to be confident about the future. National's done it before and it's time for us to do it again. Thank you. Grant? Because it's about balance. It's already been talked about by Fran in the survey. Uh, you can trust us to make sure that we do manage New Zealand's economy well in challenging times. And you know the indication that Fran gave earlier on that the ratings agencies have come through and given us the tick. It has been difficult. We have had to use our balance sheet. But we've done that to make sure that businesses have kept going and to make sure that people have been able to get the skills they need, to be able to live in the housing they need, and have the healthcare and education systems they need. The other reason that you can trust us is because we've got a record of actually showing what we'll do, how we'll pay for it. And I do think, to be frank with this audience, you've given the National Party a pretty soft pass. We're standing here today, just over two weeks out from the election. We do not have a costed plan, and the only costed plan that's been put up is a tax cut plan that nobody in this room believes add up. So you can trust us because we've got the record of getting the balance right, and we've shown you how we're going to pay for it. You've, uh, you've put the ball on a tee for me. Nicola, mm. why so late in releasing a fiscal plan? Uh, because we have seen a set of books that have been vandalised unlike any in previous history. Well, Grant, every single operating allowance you have ever set yourself, including in your fictional fiscal plans, you have broken. So this actually the fiscal, fiscal plan, plan I Nicola. present tomorrow <laughs> needs to be credible. I actually need to stick to it. You treat operating allowances as if they are sort of fantasy projections. You blow them out completely. In 2022, which by the way was not a year of COVID lockdowns, Grant went on the biggest spending budget in New Zealand history. While he was warned that more spending would drive inflation, he threw hundreds of millions at big mergers and restructures to Fato Ora, uh, Tipu Kenga, the Three Waters reforms, the income insurance scheme. That was the wrong thing to do. And we are going to chart a course that is responsible and that we stick to. We still don't have it. Well, you will look forward to it at one o'clock and I'll tell you what it'll, how it'll be di different from yours in three main ways. First, it will rest on disciplined spending. Second, it will rest on lower tax for working people. Which you can't and third, pay for. It will lead to lower debt than yours will. Virtually every economist in New Zealand thinks that your tax plan does not add up. Even if we believe you, you have to sell five billion dollars a year of New Zealand property every year forever to foreign buyers. That's a bad idea in principle and it's impossible to deliver on. Mr Robertson, we need to sell fewer than half as many homes as New Zealand sold 
just six years ago. How many of those ago, homes were over $2 million, Nicola? We need to sell fewer Nicola. than 2% of the homes worth more than $2 million. How many of those homes were over $2 two, million? Dollars? Fewer than 2% of the homes worth more than $2 million no, in New Zealand today will need buyers, to sell in order for our plan to stack up. And here's the other thing. It's not me anyway. It's Michael Riddell, and he's you. not a great fan I want of to, mine. Yeah, and he's not a great fan of mine either, <laughs> actually. You may have noticed. Um, but actually what matters is that there is principle to this. I think it's incredibly important, actually, that New Zealand says to those in the world with capital, with skill, with talent, this is a place you should be investing. We actually want your capital. We want your skills. We want because the capital we want for productive investment, Nicola, and not for speculation and property. And if the first thing we do to them is say, here's doing. the big stop sign, you're not even allowed to build a home, it doesn't send a good message. New Zealand's future is not about looking inward. No. It is about looking outward. And this policy is a signal of our intent. Lovely to break up a domestic <laughs> brouhaha. <laughs> it, it is just like my Shouldn't kitchen. Shouldn't have put us in the adjoining rooms. Yeah. <laughs> Grant, how do you respond to let us the editor uh, comments in the street? You're addicted to spending, and how much debt is too much? So in the last budget that we did, 79% of the new spending we did was cost pressures. And while obviously inflation does increase the amount of revenue a government gets, it also significantly increases the costs that a government faces. And so most of that new spending was to make sure we kept uh, the core services we need going. You know, there's been a lot of talk about whether or not we've got what we need in our health sector workforce or in our education sector workforce. We've had to find the money to pay those workforces to make sure that we do have the staff that we need here. It is about a balance, and we have given the signal that we're moving towards a lower level of government expenditure, because we did borrow significantly in order to get through COVID, and we will bring that down. But if you click your fingers and you do it right away, the very people that you want to be part of that ambitious future get excluded. So we have struck a balance going forward, as many other countries have had to do. I acknowledge the fact that that level of borrowing is not sustainable forever, and that's why we're bringing it down over the next few years. But if you thought you could turn that off straight away, the damage you would actually do would be significant to the New Zealand economy and to New Zealand society. Nicola, if Grant Robinson is the worst finance minister the country has ever seen, as you and your leader have suggested, or seem to suggest, why does Standard & Poor's Fitch & Moody's ratings seem to disagree? Well, I don't think they necessarily disagree. All I've done is said that New Zealand isn't such a basket case that they're going to downgrade us yet. But actually, well, if I'm what sure happens... Well, well, I think it is fair to say that what they have said is you're OK for now, but boy, oh boy, <laughs> you better do what needs to be done, which is a path of fiscal consolidation. They are very specific about that. And so when we look to the challenge about New Zealand's future, it is really... Does Grant have the attributes as a finance minister needed to provide that fiscal discipline over the next few years? And I know that we talk about COVID a lot, but we are spending $30 billion more this year as a country than we did during the height of COVID on an annual basis. Our deficit is bigger now than it was during some of the COVID times. So actually what's happened is we have baked in a higher level of spending. When Grant... Uh, ran in 2017. He said that he wanted to keep government spending under 30%, the historic average. It's now up over 33%, and it's never coming back under 30% again by his projections. There has been a baked-in level, a bigger government, and it's not delivering better results. Listen, That's the thing I'm worried about. We don't have shorter waiting lists at the hospitals. We don't have better standards in the schools, and crime's out of control. The spending it's, hasn't it's delivered a results. It's a series of very political answers um, there, Murray, because during the Canterbury earthquakes and the wake of the GFC, national spending did go up to the levels around 34%. And then we brought well, the books GDP. back to service. Plus. And then we, indeed, and in the same track that we're on at the moment, no, the issue like that. that we've got here, though, is that if, if Nicola wants to be in a position to say, you, you know, we're going to make all of these cuts, but nothing's going to change in terms of the way that the services you need are provided, nothing like that is going to be different. It's simply not realistic. The other half of the tax plan, so we know that the housing bit of the tax plan doesn't add up, the other half of it is a 6.5% cut in a number of government agencies that do things that people in this room want government to do. When you're faced with a crisis, you deal with what's in front of you. I mean, today, and I'm interested, Fran, in the survey, the cyclone didn't get much of, of a run. That is New Zealand's second largest ever natural disaster. 
with a bill of between nine and fourteen billion dollars. Nicola complains about allowances changing. We set the allowances in December, and the cyclones and the Auckland anniversary weekend floods happened early the next year. You have to deal with what's in front of you. Governing is not a theoretical exercise. We have a balance sheet, we've used it, and we have a plan to bring ourselves back down. Accepting all that, you found four billion dollars of savings in expenditure uh, before the budget and another four billion shortly after, or before PREFU, sorry, without much difficulty. Yet when, when Nicola and National propose savings, it's raise the gang and austerity. Mm. Surely there is ways. There's always ways of being more effective and efficient. Every business in this room knows that you do that exercise on an ongoing basis. $4 billion out of you know, expenditure in the $120, $130 billion area, we think that's achievable. And if you just want to bring it down to what we're doing with the public services, we've set a 1% to 2% cut in a range of different government agencies. That's worth but over $500 million a year for that particular part of the savings. What National's then coming along and saying is, yep, we'll do that, and then we'll add another $500 million on top of that. So I think it's reasonable to say, we think 1% to 2% is okay, but we don't think 6.5% is, because that will damage it. And I'll give an example. The Department of Conservation, you could get rid of all of the comms people, all of the policy people, and you still wouldn't save the amount of money that Nicola thinks that she can save in that agency. So these sorts of cuts will damage the services New Zealanders get. You have to find a balance. We think our savings represent that balance. Nicola, can, can I just ask about your wealth tax on foreign home buyers? If you don't get the sales you need, what are you more likely to, to do? Are you likely to reduce the tax cuts that are being proposed, or are you more likely to cut public service? We think we will get the sales that we no, need. No, no, if you don't. Well, we think that we will get the sales we need, and the way that we've put our tax plan together is that it actually rests on eight different sources of funding. There's been a lot of focus on the foreign buyer tax, but actually alongside that we've identified three other additional sources of revenue, and we've identified four areas of savings and reprioritisations from government spending. Across those eight factors, we have the funding for a tax plan. The first year of the tax plan actually generates more than half a billion dollars more in revenue than is required to deliver the income tax reductions. And that's intentional. We've put it together very conservatively and carefully so that I can stand here and be confident that even if there is variability in any of those eight measures, I can still deliver income tax reduction without having to resort to additional borrowing. And so we are confident that we can do that. And what you'll see today in our fiscal plan is that our tax plan should be seen in the context of our fiscal plan, in which we have provided significant buffers of spending that is not allocated in future to ensure that we have options when it comes to facing uh, frontline cost pressures, when it comes to the needs that the Crown accounts will have. So we've been careful, we've been conservative, we will be delivering income tax reduction. Let's be clear, it's about $2 billion of what's needed comes from that property side. And I do think if we go back to what I think was a pretty credible exercise from economists of the left and right that concluded that Nicola's at least 1,000 houses short a year from what she needs to make it add up. So it's a good question, and the answer has to be, if they're so committed to delivering the tax cuts that they are, there will be even deeper cuts to public services. There's no other way of doing it. Grant, question from the floor. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. If you could turn back time, what is the biggest change that you would make some of the decisions you've made in the last six years? Yeah, well, if, if people are accusing um, Nicola of being Whitney Houston, I'm certainly not sheer, and I can't <laughs> turn back, and I, and I can't turn back time. Um, so uh, it's it isn't possible. And and look, in a, in in my dotage, I'll be able to sit back and have a look. Surely at, you can give us an answer now. I, no, and genuinely, I can't. In the sense that if you take yourself back to March 2020 and you get a report that says unemployment's going over 10%, Adrian's in my office saying we don't know what's happening with the bond markets. You have to make the decisions in that moment. We actually recognised things as we went, you know, Murray. Like We tightened up criteria on the wage subsidy as we went along. We did change the way in which we approached some of the, the costings that we were doing for, for the small business loan scheme and those sorts of things. So we tweaked it as we went along. Everybody knows that in the end, the level of economic damage was done was significant in a spike, and then it came down quite quickly. At that point, do you turn off the tap of some of the things that we've 
already given, meaning that some businesses benefited but others didn't. Maybe we could have done that. Maybe we could have done that, but that would have been unfair in that moment. And so I know that there will be things that people in this room don't like about what we did, but we don't govern in hindsight. We govern in the here and now. I think we got it right. There was actually a comment in the survey from, from somebody who actually said, you know, I should have said no to those calls for money at the start in COVID. I don't think that's realistic if you take yourself back to 2020. Cash flow and confidence was what I promised to the business community, and I think I delivered it. What's also true is that those who don't learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. And it's an extraordinary thing when all of the parties in Parliament, except for the Labour Party, have called for an independent inquiry into the economic decision making that was made during the COVID response. The combination of extraordinary monetary policy with massive levels of quantitative easing relative to the size of our economy. At the same time as we had huge amounts of fiscal stimulus, borrowing and spending. New Zealand did a lot more of both of those things than most economies in the world. And it would be sensible to go back and look at that decision making and see, was it poorly coordinated? Did we go too hard? What we do know is that our inflation is a lot stickier than that in a lot of other countries. Our domestic inflation remains very high. Our interest rates have had to rise very fast and very quickly. We, as New Zealanders, I think have an obligation to look back and say what Which did what doing. went wrong. So no, that is not Royal true. Commission you have refused to do an independent inquiry into That's the economic what the Royal response Commission is. because you're afraid of what it will show. No, it's what the Royal Commission is. And actually, when you look at us globally, we did invest significant amounts of money, but so did a lot of other countries, and there has been a global inflation spike. I know the National Party wants to make me responsible for inflation, double-digit inflation in the UK and Europe. It isn't actually true. We're in about the middle of the pack of where inflation peaked, and it is coming down, and it is forecast to be inside the Reserve Bank's ban next year. Cumulatively, next. we've had a lot more inflation than Australia, which is a comparator economy. Europe and the UK also experienced an energy crisis as a result of the Ukraine conflict. We don't conflict. somehow or rather and live these, separately from the rest of the our, world, though, do we? And our inflation remains a lot higher than the United States, for example. And what we can see is that there are very valid questions about the approach we took to monetary Which and fiscal Which have been covered policy. in the Royal Commission. Nicola, you told reporters on Wednesday that you'd absolutely stick to your budget allowances unless there was a disaster. Mm. Isn't that exactly what the government's been dealing with for the last three years, an economic shock like no other? Yes, in 2020 and 2021. But what in 2022 justified having a massive budget operating allowance that was well outside what had been committed just six months previous or in uh, their pre-election commitments? What in their first year of office meant right from Grant's very first budget, his operating allowance vastly exceeded what he campaigned on, and that's because he didn't leave a single dollar uh, for the buffers and contingencies that a good budget needs to have. I don't accept that this is all about natural disasters. Actually, government spending is up 80% annually. As a proportion of the economy, it is a lot higher than it was. What has happened is across government, we've had a baked-in level of bigger government without the results to show for it. And this is the thing that's really important to me. It's actually about, as a finance minister, what am I doing to ensure accountability for the money that's being spent? Driving results. That's why I want to set better public service targets so that I can hold ministers accountable for delivering to them, so I can measure where the money's having impact, so I can look at what the data's telling me about what's working and not what's not working. That's the discipline that should be provided for taxpayers' money. And yet one of the first things the Labor government did was remove those targets, remove the health sector targets, because somehow the view was they didn't matter anymore. Well, they do matter, and we need to hold so ourselves accountable to them. So two-thirds of that additional spending has gone on health, education and social development, much of what, which are automatic increases in terms of what happens in terms of expenditure. If you have people, more people unemployed or you need to deal with uh, a, a pandemic that's in front of you. The allowances are a means to an end, and the end is the big fiscal goals. If you actually take a look at the allowances that we set in December of each year and set them alongside the levels of debt that were projected and the levels of unemployment that were projected, we've actually undershot in many of those years on those. 
Treasury right now had us up with net debt under the old measure up over 50 per cent a couple of years ago. We'll actually peak under the old measure around 40 per cent. And again, we don't live in a vacuum here. I didn't respond before around the ratings agency's point. They upgraded us during COVID because they were confident in our performance, and they've maintained a stable outlook at one of the highest ratings that they can give. So it's not that they're saying, oh, there's some terrible thing on the horizon. They're confident in the underpinnings of our economy, and they're confident in the management we've had. Have there been challenges? Yes. Has it been tough for businesses and households? Yes. But in order to get through that, you've got to be balanced, and you do need to be disciplined, but you also have to look after people. And I think sometimes when I read things that are in the survey, and I hear what Nicola has said, there's a divorcing there of the lives of all New Zealanders. People in this room generate the wealth and income for New Zealand, and that is vital, and that is important. I also think we share the view that we need to lift everybody up in order to be able to achieve the ambitious future we've got. That's the balance you have to strike when you're in government. Let me okay, accept so your premise. Your premise is correct. The whole point of an economy is to deliver better for people. But by that measure, actually that's where you're failing most because we are in a cost of living crisis that is ravaging households on low and median incomes. People are in debt arrears, they are struggling to pay their mortgages, the queues at the food banks haven't been longer, the number of children living in benefit dependent households has soared, educational achievement among lower socio-economic communities in particular <laughs> has gone down, the waiting and times in our emergency rooms are longer, victims of crime are increasing. We so lift my the point minimum is this, wage to support don't people, give you me oppose that it. the spending has all been about people because many people are worse off as a result. And every time we propose something that's going to benefit those low and middle income peoples, the National Party oppose it. I don't accept Question that. Question for you both. How well placed is uh, New Zealand should we unfortunately hit another pandemic? And would you again subsidise business to keep people in work? Grant? Yeah, um, we are in a good place when you look at our balance sheet. So we set ourselves uh, a debt ceiling of 30% of GDP under the measure we now use. Um, we're sitting at around 18. We're going to peak at about 21 or 22. So there's plenty of headroom in there should we need to use the balance sheet again. In terms of subsidising and supporting business, yes, I would. Um, we definitely did learn lessons from the way the wage subsidy scheme worked. And the value that people felt in that wage subsidy scheme in face of so much uncertainty with COVID was it gave them that confidence and we did the 12 weeks all at once and, and, and put that out there. I think now we probably would tweak elements of that, but I still believe that by supporting businesses to keep their employees in work, and bear in mind it was a subsidy for most businesses, they were topping it up uh, themselves. I think that was the right thing to do. If we were facing the kind of global inflation spike we are now, with unemployment up at six, seven percent, we'd be in trouble. The reason we're getting through in, in a reasonable state at the moment is because people are in work. So therefore, yes, I would continue to support business in, in that kind of situation. Nicola? Our debt position is of concern. Uh, by the measure that Grant set in 2017, uh, which he said debt shouldn't exceed 20% of GDP, we're now at about 42. So we have well exceeded the historic levels of debt that we as a small uh, economy have felt comfortable with, and we are going to have to uh, get just, that debt position down. I'm just going to finish my answer, though, I right? let you finish yours. And we're going to have to get that debt position down so that we are more resilient in the face of a future pandemic. I think that using a wage subsidy scheme when businesses are not able to operate and workers are not able to work is the right thing to do. We need to make sure it's designed carefully and that's another reason why, why we owe ourselves as a country the exercise of going back and thoroughly examining the details of the economic response uh, during the COVID pandemic. Questions from the floor for you, Nicola. There's two or three on the same topic. Uh, I'll try to combine them into one. Does the National Party commit to retaining and listening to the advice of the Climate Change Commission? And will you help businesses to decarbonise? Uh, yes, and our approach to this has been that we think this is a bipartisan issue. One of the most important things for decarbonising our economy is giving clarity that polluters will pay a higher price for fossil fuels into the future. That's why we signed up to the Zero Carbon Act uh, and the emission reduction budgets. And we think the emissions trading scheme 
is the key tool for driving down emission reduction. Uh, and we want to give uh, all uh, polluters and all economic actors certainty that that scheme will operate credibly with us. We think on a case-by-case -case basis there will be opportunities to work alongside businesses, including via investment, to reduce emissions, but we are not going to be cutting checks to big polluters to ask them nicely to decarbonise when actually that's the work they should be doing themselves. Can I just comment briefly? I know that was a question for Nicola Murray, but I think it is a really important distinction here. The good news is that National signed up to the Zero Carbon Act and the big goals that are in there, and, and, and that is something that actually, I think Todd Muller was the spokesperson at the time, and it is something that was a really welcome development. However, the actual plans to meet the goals require the government to be a very active player in that. The reason that we have taken the emissions trading scheme revenue and recycled all of it into our climate emergency response fund is because we need to make more rapid progress with emissions reduction. And the issue that National now have is all of that money in their budget now goes to fund the tax cuts. And I don't accept that us partnering with New Zealand Steel to get a 1% overall reduction in emissions is a bad thing, nor is it a bad thing to work with Fonterra, because actually the reality is the market won't do that on its own. It does need the support and assistance from a government. Second point is, this to me is the central economic issue of our time. Because when I was in Europe last year, those supermarket buyers in the UK said, unless you can tell me exactly the climate provenance of these products that are arriving in our stores, we're not going to be buying you your goods in the future. So whichever way you cut it, this has to be the priority. And not supporting business to do that decarbonisation will make things worse economically and environmentally. Given all that, what in your opinion is National's most dangerous policy. Most dangerous policy. I actually have to say, it's this is probably not going to be exactly the answer you were after, Murray, but actually, as I've sat and listen, listens, well, the most dangerous thing is that none of it adds up, but the second most dangerous thing is actually the policy that was announced around social development and welfare. Because while every single one of us in this room wants to make sure that every person who can work should work, what I heard when I heard that announcement this week was the continuation of a punching down in our society. And we were talking before about how we're more cohesive and how we're more inclusive. We're actually seeing more people exit from benefit into work than we ever have before because we've worked hard to be active in doing that. But the kinds of punitive things I were hearing will make children's lives worse and have been proven not to work around the world. So you want to know what I think the most dangerous policy is? It's actually one like that that's going to exacerbate poverty in our society. Nicola, a response? The best way to help people out of poverty is to give them the dignity of work. And under your government's approach to social welfare, despite record job vacancies, we have more than 50,000 additional people on a job seeker benefit. Actually, if those people can work, the obligation the state has is to support them into work, to ensure that they face both the right supports and incentives that get them on their way. And our policy is about saying to people who are uh, receiving welfare, we want better for you, we want you back in work, how can we help, here's the plan, what can we do to support you, you do your bit, we'll do ours. If you don't do your bit, then yes. In a world of rights, there are also responsibilities and there will be consequences. The best thing that we can do to lift children out of poverty is actually get their parents into paid work. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to take that obligation very seriously. It's, it is about intervening differently. It's about working alongside the community. It's about looking at literacy. It's about looking at addiction. All of that is possible, but it's not good enough to simply say, we'll increase the size of your benefit. But that's not what we've done. What we've done is actually work actively alongside those people to move them into work. And we do have a situation now where we've got record numbers of New Zealanders in work, and the answer is not making the lives of their children more difficult. So why are there 50,000 more people because on a job seeker people, benefit Because there's today. more people, Nicola, and the percentage is around about the same. Nicola, in the realm of reality, rather than hypothetical. If New Zealand First set a bottom line for its support was a $3 billion provincial growth fund, <laughs> what would your response be? 
Look, I'm not going to get into that, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> no, no, this is a really serious answer. I think the people in this room need to hear it. I don't want to go into government with New Zealand first, okay? Our preference, our strong preference, is a national act coalition. And the, actually, the only way that doesn't happen right now is if a bunch of people decide, instead of giving their party vote to national, they're going to do something different. I know that most New Zealanders see it's time for a change of government. Our message to them is, if you want to change the government, give your vote to us. A vote for any other party risks a continuation so, so of Nicola, the current that's a, that's regime. A, that's a terrific political answer. But, but it's important, we understand, we understand, because I'm not going to indulge I, I, I discussions about New Zealand first, because our, our ambition is clear. I get it's important to you and I get it's your preference, but if it's the people's preference that Winston is there, what would your response be? My response would be, that's a negotiation point for Chris Luxon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Murray, there is a really simple way of making sure that Winston Peters doesn't control the next government, you party vote Labour, because he ain't working with us <laughs> and we ain't working with him. It's, 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 it's like you're both political uh, experts or, or, or <laughs> professionals. Um, Time is almost at a close. One last question for you both. And I'd ask you to please try to keep it within a minute. <laughs> What's the nicest thing you can say about the other as a person? <laughs> I'm happy to start on that. I mean, Nicola is a, is a very intelligent, extremely diligent uh, politician. I've observed that across the House and over many years as we've run against each other uh, in, in Wellington Central. And so while I disagree fundamentally with Nationals' uh, policy prescription and where they will take the country, if the event occurs sometime long into the future when Nicola becomes mm -hmm. the Minister of Finance, New Zealand will have someone who will work hard and is a very intelligent and clever person. And I um, think that Grant cares deeply and uh, I had the opportunity as a new candidate to campaign alongside him in Wellington Central, an electorate that is famous for having an extremely high proportion of Labour and Green voters. <laughs> uh, and Very during wise. that time when I campaigned against him, he treated me with respect and dignity, which in a situation where there are rooms full of people who want to barrack you down, uh, is very much appreciated and I think uh, speaks to a degree of civility that we all wish to maintain in our politics. Uh, and I do admire anyone who steps into the shoes that he has had to step into in recent years. Um, so I can keep going, but you know we're staying next <laughs> to each other, so we might I have more opportunities in the corridor later. <laughs> Get a room. Joining <laughs> <laughs> ones, yeah, that's right. Nicola, yeah. 60 seconds for you to uh, deliver a closing summary, please. The New Zealand economy is in a difficult spot. If we keep going the way we're going, the way ahead will be more hard than it needs to be. This election is about who is best placed to rebuild our economy in order to reduce the cost of living, to lift incomes for all, and ensure that New Zealand can sustainably fund the public services we all rely on. National's proposition at this election is it's time for disciplined government, that will reduce the tax that working people pay, that will ensure a better regulatory environment so that businesses have the confidence to invest, that will lift standards in education, take a tougher stance on law and order, deliver better infrastructure using the private sector. That is a very different economic path than the one we have been down. If you don't like the way New Zealand is going, don't vote for more of the same party vote national. Great. It's been an extremely tough few years for New Zealanders and I want to thank every single business owner, every single worker and the entire community for the way that we've got through this together. Despite the challenges, we do have an economy that's nearly 8% larger than it was before COVID. We have had unemployment under 4% for two years. Our level of debt compares extremely well internationally and we have a pathway back to surplus. Now is the opportunity to consolidate the gains we've made, to understand the anger, the anxiety, and the tiredness that is in our community, but realise that this is now New Zealand's chance to build on our strengths, to be the best little trading nation in the world, to truly address climate change issues and find the economic opportunities that lie within them, 
to lift up the aspirations and the opportunities of every young New Zealander through lifting their skills, giving them a warm, dry, safe home to live in and a strong community around you. If you want to get the balance right in the future for New Zealand, you do need to give your party vote to Labor. Can I ask you both to remain on stage while Tim McCready comes up to deliver our vote of thanks? Um, but could we please thank Grant and Nicholas? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Grant, Nicola, and of course, Murray, for a robust uh, debate there. And I don't think there has ever been or will ever be again a finance debate that name checks both Cher and Whitney Houston. Um, I'd like to invite uh, up onto the stage uh, Deloitte Chair Thomas Pippos, uh, who is going to give our closing comments and vote of thanks. Thanks very much. It's uh, not often that we get to go to a 21st nowadays, and um, <laughs> some would say, how's everyone grown up? Look at them all. I mean, Fran must have started in her late teens, uh, <laughs> with, with the mood of the boardroom now 21 years old, um, and still both, both the mood of the boardroom and Fran, Fran going from strength to strength. I think uh, I did do some research. I think Nicola was slightly older than Fran, uh, probably towards the end of her tertiary studies at that point in time. Um, thereafter working as a policy advisor to Bill English and then later John Key. I think Grant was a little older again, um, had recently moved from MFAT and then to a ministerial advisor to Marianne Hobbs and then I think um, to Helen Clark. This is all back 21 years ago. Both Grant and Nicola, somewhat but not exclusively, uh, children of the Beltway. Um, in terms of the mood of the boardroom, um, part of the business calendar and particularly in an election year, uh, there's an exclusive list of uh, Ministers of Finance that have actually participated in the mood of the boardroom over that period of time. Uh, Michael Cullen uh, for seven years, albeit he was the Minister of Finance for nine years. I think Bill English similarly for around eight years. I think we had a cameo of Stephen Joyce for one year. Um, Grant, I think you've had six years, um, excepting that both Bill and Grant, I think you participated extensively also when you were in your shadow finance roles. And I think Nicola, this must be your second term in the mood of the boardroom. Um, accepting uh, all that tenure, uh, and, and particularly in relation to Nicola and Grant, uh, are they bored with it? They don't certainly seem to be. And um, personally, I think it was actually a great um, discussion today, particularly as people were not talking over each other and everyone was able to actually comprehend and um, make decisions in terms of themselves, in terms of what resonated or what doesn't actually resonate. In terms of um, a closing comment, comment um, to me, the economy is the bedrock upon which everything in society grows from. Uh, without an economy, there's nothing. Now, that doesn't say that the economy is everything, of course. So we live in a world of limited resources, with the Minister of Finance effectively needing to ration those resources in the way in which they think makes sense. At one way, it's a thankless role, uh, but it's, critically, it's obviously a critical one. It's therefore fitting to thank both uh, Grant and Nicola for the political roles that they're proposing to take and have taken in terms of the finance role and encourage whoever the next Minister of Finance is uh, to be the guardian of the economy for the future generations who need to rely upon it and to ensure that those generations are able to have a happy ever after type of outcome as a consequence of their um, stewardship. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Thomas, very well said. Uh, we've talked a lot about Murder the Boardroom, just a, um, a, a note that there will be copies of that report available for you on your way out. There's 40 pages of quality content in there, so worth picking up a copy. Uh, to bring today's event to a close, uh, please join me in welcoming back onto the stage Fran O'Sullivan for the last word. to make um, a couple of comments about uh, people who have contributed a lot uh, during uh, these uh, couple of decades of mood of the boardroom. Uh, the finance ministers, they each in their own way, Michael Cullen, Single Market with Australia, Cullen Fund, various initiatives, 
Mom with National, Bill English, uh, took the economy through the GFC, and Grant, you took us through COVID. So I think each of these have contributed majorly over that time. And uh, it's something I think we can all be proud of, because you do get tested in this uh, particular fora. I do want to thank uh, Business New Zealand for joining us in this a uh, couple of years or so into the survey. Uh, also, um, Deloitte, Thomas, um, I think you were several iterations back in your career when we first started getting together in, on tax uh, questions back in 2006. And uh, we've all uh, moved along a bit since then. Uh, I also want to acknowledge here uh, Peter Thompson from Barfoot, who was an early sponsor, and Westpac, and all the other sponsors who have joined us over the years and supported the project. Uh, it's been a long time uh, bringing to fruition, and it has grown. Uh, the first one was probably about six broadsheet pages, and now we're 40 in a compact, so it's a big exercise now. Uh, we couldn't do it in the old way, where we just sat there with calculators into the middle of the night and kept forgetting things and having to start again and, uh, and reading people's um, handwriting on, on faxed uh, questionnaires back. It was a lot of time ringing people back and saying, did you really say that, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but anyway, um, SurveyMonkey is a brilliant tool, I have to say. Uh, I also do want to thank the teams here, uh, Duncan Bridgman and his team at the Business Herald and across business more generally, and you'll see quite a lot of that in the paper, but also online and through the radio stations over the next day or two as we play out the results. Uh, but particularly also the team that has worked very hard over the last uh, six weeks to bring this together, uh, Tim McCready, Natalia Rimmel, Bill Bennett, Graham Skellen, uh, the team from the Chamber who have helped on this. It's a damn big exercise, frankly, and uh, there's a lot of numbers to deal with and a lot of checking and fact-checking and a lot of analysis. I thank everyone who's contributed, all the sponsors who've uh, been interviewed for this report, and of course the generosity of our two main political protagonists, because you do get beaten up a wee bit along the way, but you're generous and you turn up each year, and we thank you for being frank in the way you are. Thank you.